Welcome to all of you to our second Connections reading of, of the fall semester. It's been a different experience for all of us, and we've, we've done the best we can to continue the tradition that we've had over the past, now going on 30 years, of bringing authors to the college community. And now, with, with this format, with people from literally all over the world, so I, I wanna welcome you. My name is Neil Dwyer. I'm an English professor at the College of Southern Maryland and I help um, organize these readings. Um, I, we have a reading coming up uh, on December 2nd. And for more information about our programs, please go to the college uh, homepage and um, just uh, search connections and you'll get all the information that you need. Um, to order a copy of of A Wolf by the Ears. Um, I'm going to provide you with a link um, and, I, and I, I really encourage you to, to do that um, sooner rather than later. Um, it's, it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce Michael Glazer and Wayne Carlin. Um, we've, been, we've been doing this for so long and it's, it, the, the, the format's not ideal, but we, we still, we feel that it's important for us to emphasize, you know, our, our shared humanity. So I will begin by introducing Michael and then I'll, I'll leave. Michael Glazer, Maryland's former poet laureate, has been a friend of the Southern Maryland community for over 30 years. He's a teacher, a poet, a father, a friend, and a person to rely on. He has and continues to support this program, Connections, but more than that, he has and continues to inspire and mentor through his teaching. Michael is a person who believes in the power of sharing stories and the power of wanting to be seen wholly for who we are. Years ago, I invited Michael to be a guest speaker in, in one of my classes. And we didn't really know each other too well back then, but he graciously agreed. And during this class, we experienced Michael's gentle humanity, his spirit, and we shared and discussed the honest conversation he has with himself every time he writes a poem. A few, few weeks later, Michael told me about this story. He was in a grocery store checkout line, and he showed his ID to sign a check, and the cashier was a member of the class that he had visited in, in, on, uh, at the college campus. And, and the, the cashier asked, are you the Michael Glazer? And he said, yes. And she reached over the counter and hugged him. <laughs> and that is not random. It is genuine. Through his writing and teaching and listening, Michael has for years given the Southern Maryland community the gift of his wisdom and gentle and love-giving spirit. And may you pass it on as he does. Wow, thank you, Neil. What, I needed that story today. Um, Michael, I'd like, to know if, I'd like to know if she still asked for your ID. I, I think I gave her my credit card. And, and often okay. people would say, are you the Michael Glazer? And they meant Paul Michael Glazer, but... Um, <laughs> So, so thank you, thank you, Neil. Um, it, it strikes me, um, Wayne, and and people in the audience that that today um, we are at a moment in time in our country where we are once again defining ourselves and engaged in a struggle with who we are as a country and who we want to be as a people. And I, I'm taken by the fact that your novel, Wayne, is, is really about another moment in time like that, where we were deeply engaged in um, trying to figure out who we wanted to be as a country and how we wanted to be. Um, and so what I'd like to do is, is maybe start by asking you a couple of questions to help frame um, the novel and then um, move in and, and, and get you to read parts of the novel that, that help illustrate the themes and the, the characters who are in it. 
Thank you. I, I think your writing is so amazing and, and exquisitely precise that, that one of the best ways for anybody to understand what this novel is about and, and why they would want to read it is to hear you read parts from it. So I, I want at the beginning to kind of limit the talk and, and more the listening. And then we can move to, to questions later on. So the, the novel, A Wolf by the Ears, um, has a title that at first I did not understand. And I wonder if you would explain how you came across that, why you chose that title, and then segue from that into the poem by Lucille Clifton that you use as an epigraph um, for the entire novel, because I think it does a beautiful job of setting the scene for what, what we read in the novel. Sure. The um, title comes from a, a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote uh, to John Holmes. And the entire sentence is this, but as it is, we have a wolf by the ears and we can neither hold him nor safely let him go. Justice is in one scale and self-preservation in the other. The wolf he's referring to there is, is the institution of slavery. And what it, it's, it's interesting that a, a lot of times now people say that we have to judge historical characters by the context of their times, uh, meaning that, well, Jefferson lived in a time of slavery, he owned slaves, and therefore we can't judge him about owning slaves. But what you see in a, in a quote like that is that he, like, like many other people, particularly many other people who founded this country, who were well aware that slavery was was evil was something that that contradicted the the whole ideology of of uh, freedom of each person being e equal and having equal rights and so on uh, he refers to it as a wolf we're holding by the ears because he under you know his, his understanding is that our whole way of life his whole way of life his lifestyle depended on the, on the institution of slavery. And therefore is in that contradiction between, um, yeah, I know it's right. I know justice on one hand says that we should not have this, uh, on, but on the other hand, we can't live without this. And also by using a wolf, you know, there's the fear mm -hmm. that uh, these people that we have held unjustly are going to demand their, their justice. Um, and that, you know, again, that's the, the, take that out of just the idea of the context of his age. The context of his age was, was that the people who wrote the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution knew very well, you know, that this, this was a, a moral contradiction in the way that they wanted to order the world. Um, I'm going to read, I'll read the, uh, the poem by Lucille Clifton, which is called Slave Ships. And the, the, novel actually is, is dedicated to a seal. It's a friend of both of ours. And there are a number of, of images from her poetry. One, one is that, that, that came from this poem. Loaded like spoons into the belly of Jesus, where we lay for weeks, for months, in the sweat and stink of our own breathing. Jesus, why do you not protect us? chained to the heart of the angel where the prayers we never tell are hot and red as our bloody ankles. Jesus, angel, can these be men who vomit us out from ships called Jesus, angel, grace of God onto a heathen country. Jesus, angel, ever again, never again can this tongue speak. Can these bones walk? Grace of God. Can this sin live? And, and what struck Lucille, of course, in writing this was these, these were the, the names of slave ships, Jesus, angel, grace of God. So th there's that, there's that irony, but there's also the, the way that um, the enslaved people on those ships eventually adopted that religion for themselves in a completely reverse way as, as meant by, by the slave ships. What strikes me uh, about the power of that poem to begin the novel is, at least as I grew up, um, 
and, and, and schooling. I, I learned that slavery was a bad thing, but I was glossed over. It was glossed over what slavery really was and, and the moral contradiction that you were talking about between the Constitution and how the writers of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights live their lives. Um, it, we, we live often in denial of this. This is what the enslaved Africans experienced being brought over to the United States. They, they, were, not, they were not treated with any kind of humanity. And, um, and we, it's, I think it's so important that we, we understand, and I think your novel helps us understand um, the fact that there's a, for, for many white people like me, there's a real disconnect between what I learned about what it was to be a slave and, and what it really was. Most of the, most of the writing um, about uh, the history of, of slavery centers um, early times um, when the slaves were, were when freed Africans were brought here and made slaves. Yeah, that, the your, no, your novel centers on, on the War of 1812. Talk a little bit about why you chose that context. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to also uh, go back a little bit to what you said. Um, that one, one of the, the things we see in that, in that poem also is, you know, there's, there's the victimization, but there's also the way that the enslaved people had the strength to take that for their own. You know, they here's here's Jesus the slave ship, and here is the Jesus that becomes a, a figure of liberation. You know, the two different ways of looking at the Bible, the two mm -hmm. different ways of, of looking at the definition of freedom for our country. Wow. So we look at the War of eighteen twelve, and like you know, the, the the history we're taught about all American wars is well, they're about freedom, one way or another. They're they're about freedom. Um, what you found, and what fascinated me about that period period was that um, about, about uh, 5,000 slaves, enslaved people went over to the British during that war because the British recruited them. The British said that if, uh, if you join us, if you come over to us and fight for us, we will guarantee you freedom. So for those 5,000 slaves that mainly came from the area that, that you and I live in, and from Northern Virginia, from the Tidewater area. Um, they ran away, they were uh, liberated by the British in places, they revolted in their, on their plantations in other places and went over to the v British to fight for them. Uh, one, one of the key you know, books I had read that fascinated me about this was uh, um, a, a book by uh, Alan Taylor called The Internal Enemy. You know, but again, what, what struck me about that is this, uh, again, we look at, we, we define freedom in two different ways, depending on where we are in, in, uh, in, the, in the context of that. So for the, for the, for the enslaved people, yeah. going to the British, fighting against the Americans, um, was for their definition of freedom. Thank you. So the novel has has three main characters: uh, Tower Hill, Sarai, and and Jacob Hallam, um, and and the the story centers around them in in some amazing and important ways. I wonder if if you could share um, reading some passages that would introduce us to both of them and and how their their relationship between those times around 1812. Um, and the, the, the tensions that they were feeling and the desire to, of, of, of some enslaved people to join the British against the United States. Uh, the three main characters, Tower Hill, Jacob, and Sarai. Uh, J Jacob is the enslaver. He is the owner of the plantation. Um, Tower Hill and Sarai are enslaved people. But and this is based uh, on, on a personage like Jefferson, certainly not Jefferson himself, but a personage like Jefferson, who um, again, knew that slavery was evil and eventually wanted to liberate the slaves, actually and send them back to Africa. Uh, so I, I set up Jacob and Jacob's father and mother as people who did 
not, you know, they, they were against the idea of slavery, yet they owned slaves. Um, but to, out of that uh, battle of their conscience, they had educated Sarai and Tower Hill. Uh, Jacob's father bought them as, as when Tower Hill was five and Sarai was a baby off of the ship that they came from, off of the ship that, like in Lucille's poem, I call Jesus. And he had educated them along with Jacob. So they grew up as brothers and sisters until the time where they had to understand that they, that they were slaves. Um, the other relationship between them is that, is that uh, Sarai became Jacob's mistress. And the other, uh, where, where I'll start reading this is when Tower Hill is going to meet the British in order to arrange for the you know, his, his brethren to come over from the population of the plantation, which is called Tower Hill also, and join the British. Um, so, his bat, <coughs> excuse me, his paddle breaks glowing threads of phosphorescence that trail the blade in the black water. Clouds of fireflies dance like drunkards over their own mirrored images on that opaque surface and are mirrored themselves in the white swirls of stars overhead. Observing this trinity of light, Tower Hill feels he is standing just outside some secret door of understanding. At the same time in this world, he wishes it were darker. All of this agitated illumination increases the danger that patrollers will spot him, a black silhouette hunched against the heavens. He pushes his mind, his arms, back to the simple rhythm of paddling, tells himself there's nothing to fear. The word mirrored comes back into his mind as if someone whispers it into his ear. The night is the reverse world, the world in the mirror, the black world, his world. He knows the lay of the land in the darkness. He knows the way all the familiar landmarks of the day shift subtly. He knows day or night the secret trails the hidden hollows, the skein of creeks through marsh grass, the shifting currents of the river, the hidden paths through the forests. They are the coinage through which he will buy freedom. They are what he has to sell as he had once been sold. As those words come into his mind, his thoughts flow into a different channel of memory. The touch of a breeze on his skin dries the sweat on his forehead, awakens the way he had felt when he was five years old and naked on the selling block, torn from the arms of his dead mother, or must have been torn. His, his vague right recall of terrifying shouts and barking laughter, of looming forms and distorted red faces and painfully poking fingers are all couched in frames by the sight of the children he has since seen sold or by the stories he had been told by older slaves and by the man who bought him on that day, brought out from the belly of a ship called Jesus as if to a new birth, the baby Sarai clutched in his arms, both of them waiting for their names. His mother, Jesus, the selling block, thrice born. Mm. And he looks at this now as being born a fourth time as he goes over to the British and, and to his uh, freedom. I point out also that for the British, this is why they wanted enslaved people to come over. They knew the land. They knew all the secret ways of getting around at night. They knew the weaknesses that their, their plantations, which the British were raiding, would have. So, so Tower Hill um, does lead other enslaved people from the plantation in the revolt to join the British. Um, can you read some parts of the novel to describe um, some of the changes in, in him? And, and then... well, before that, I'd, I'd, like to, um, I'd like to read something of the relationship between um, Jacob and Sarai. Good. All right. Thank you. Getting into that. Um, because the, this trio, I mean, is, is, and the conflict between them is the heart of the novel. And for Sarai, it's very, um, you know, it's, it's, it's much more of a, of a, of a conflict because she's enslaved and yet has developed feelings for Jacob, uh, yet is an exploited person, much like you know, Jefferson and Sally Hemings, though much younger people. 
So it, it, I want to start this with, with Jacob is looking at um, the list of, of, of enslaved people that he is planning to sell in order to meet the debts that it's owed on the plantation, which is, and which is why he feels he has to sell them. Tower Hill knows this, which is giving urgency to his plan to go over to the British. So this is starting with Jacob and then Sarai. In front of him are two pieces, pieces of parchment, two choices in binary opposition. One sheet, a list of the debts he owes William Clary and Company Boston for the shabby comfort of this room. The other sheet listing the property, what he would sell to meet this year's interest on his debt. The sad inventory of what once had been a prosperous, and he'd like to think, happy corner of the world. He holds the quill over Tower Hill's name. Of course he will not sell him. He'd place him on top of the list as a, a, a kind of what? Dare to himself? He'd placed his name there because he could. He is not proud of the act. He is not certain it is an act in another sense of the word. A shadow falls across the list. Jacob tries to cover Tower Hill's name with his hand, forgetting the quilly clutches. A black blot spreads over the name. He closes his eyes, knowing not only who has walked in behind him, whose breath he imagines he can feel on his neck, the hairs rising there, but also what the reproachful expression on Sarai's face would look like. Now we go to Sarai's point of view. Good, yeah. The hand of God hovering over the list on the desk. She wishes she could cause him to spill more ink, blot out all the names. She bends to kiss him, to kiss him, to kill him. She knows he would not sell her nor exile her to the fields if she refused him her body. Nor will what she is doing prevent him from selling any of her brethren. She cannot play the want and seductress with him as Tower Hill wanted to think. She's certain that convenient lie is not even one Tower Hill believes anymore. If she is to sin, at least let it be with that, without the hypocrisy exhibited by this man, rising to kiss her back now, the familiar hardness of him pressed against her, her, her body reacting as if trained by habit. He doesn't only own you, Tower Hill had said bitterly, he created you just as his father created us educated monkeys, malleable brown clay. She seals her mouth to Jacob's. She is a story in one of the books on these shelves that only come to life when it was read. A fairy story. You know, she knew Tower Hill was right, had known even before he put it into words. Jacob's first intimacy, even before the night he had made love to her in this room, had seemed to reveal to her had been to reveal to her the agonies of his soul about their disparate and unequal conditions. Agonies she is now convinced that he clung to in order to feel he had a soul. How can I exist with these contradictions, Sarai, he would ask her, as if she were the representative of the bonded. But to take our slaves is to enslave us. It is to lose the ground we stand upon. The existence of this plantation, this separation, this fortress is the only way I can continue to protect you. Don't worry, Tower Hill had assured her just a week before. He will never sell us, not you and me, with a monument to his virtue. How attractive Jacob's struggle to exist as a moral man had once seemed to her. It had entered the awakening sap of her body as it entered the awakening awareness of her mind to the injustice of the world. This man, her lover, was sincere in, her, in his hypocrisy. At times she hated him for that. At other times she regarded it in the same way one would see a scar or deformity on the body of a lover. It was still love. The irony does not escape her that one of the many gifts he had given her was the capacity to see his self-deception. She was 15 the first time Jacob had come to her a few days before Christmas that year. His wife's door was tight shut to hold in the heat from the small fireplace, the parquet hallway floor at the, at the threshold where Sarai slept cold as ice, slept twitchy as Rebecca described a house slave's night, her brain ready to be jerked out of dreams. So that when she first became aware, aware of Jacob in his long nightdress, 
it was he was moving toward her in the space of the hallway, lambent, trailing in and out of a dream, the candle in his hand throwing a flickering light that made his smile do odd tricks, as if the features of his face were malleable. He had extended his other hand to her, and she took it, let him pull her to her feet, pull her to this room. He, he had stood staring at her as if expecting a slap or a blessing, the tug between power and conscience that, always, that would always be there confused in his eyes, the same tug she supposed she had felt, each for a different meaning, the power to do what he wished without consequence, the power to use his guilt about that to control him. Mm. At 15, she had known that already, and under all of it, stronger than any of it was curiosity and desire. He had stood paralyzed, but she had raised her shift, pulling it up to her chest, parted, parted her legs slightly. He groaned, raised his own nightgown in a parallel action to her own, presenting a sight that forced a laugh from her at the practicality of bodies. When she cried out in pain a few seconds later, he had covered her mouth with his hand, an act of ownership, more so than the lovemaking itself. Had his wife lay abed awake and heard that cry, if not on that night, and surely on others when its nature changed. But on that night, she lay under his weight and her eyes went to the books in the shelves above them, their smell of leather and glue and paper becoming for her part of the smell of sex. The book seemed to be witnessing this human act. And as he thrust into her, she fought her own desire, put herself inside their covers as she still did from that day, seeing herself and what was happening to her as if she was in the safety of a story. Mm. Wow. And then, that, uh, that, that captures so powerfully for me the, um, the difference between the experience of, of Jacob and the experience of Sarai. It captures what, what it means to not have the choices that people who are enslaved do not have. And they are not treated like human beings and they do not have the choices that human beings have. Um, and, and so it's no wonder that, I mean, he set up so beautifully that, that um, Tower Hill then wants to fight against that, to join the British and, um, and, and bring others with him to do that. Perhaps you could talk a little about that and, and read, read to us a little bit about what goes on on there. Yeah, I think that that pattern is a kind of Janus pattern. You know, there's every side is has its reverse. Every way of looking at it, that 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 attitude that Sarai has to Jacob is reflected in in the whole system. It's it's looking at history from the top and looking at it from the bottom. So Tower Hill, um, there's a revolt on the plantation. They, they go over to the British. Um, Sarai wants to go with them, but then she's rejected by the other enslaved people because she had been Jacob's mistress. Um, Tower Hill joins the British with, and they become what the British called and what were called the colonial Marines, which were the African, African American ex-slaves who fought for the British. And they raided plantations up and down uh, Southern Maryland. Um, on, I'm going to read you a little passage of this. This takes place as the as the raid on Leonardtown, which is in the county where Michael and I live, takes place. It's the county seat. And one thing to know about Leonardtown is the main street called Washington Street that goes up from the from the bay, Breton Bay, to the center of town, uh, was where slaves were brought, coffled to be sold in that center. So Tower Hill in this raid is going back from to the very place where he had been um, first bound and sold in Leonardtown Square. He will, re he will return to Leonardtown with a weapon in his hands and power at his back, wearing the red coat of his country's enemies. Back to the town square where as a small boy, hastily washed of the effluvia of his dead mother, 
it was displayed and sold on the auction block. Pride from her dead arms in the hold of the slave ship Jesus. Pride from the memory of her face and name from everything except the feel of those arms. Death gripped tight around him. Death stink emanating from the body of the woman who had given him life. His own arms wrapped around baby Sarai, pride as well from her own mother as she died in childbirth. Since the uprising, every torch he lit and touched and touched to a house or a field has been a liberation of his heart. And in Leonardtown, he will burn the portal of his birth into this country. He spins around to face the front, front rank. For a second, he pauses, taken by the sight of them, standing straight in their red tunics, their smartly plumed leather top hats slightly cocked, narrow side brims worn left side up and right side down, a style the Black Marines have adopted as their own. Their Baker rifles bristling with two foot long bayonets are held at identical 90 degree angles. So from the side, they seem like a single weapon. The company looks as sharp and dangerous as those bayonets. Something swells in him. A short time ago, these fighters had been stooped, shuffling wraiths, shadows of men, their rebellious free natures expressed only in furtive mutters, the subtle camouflage of song and the equally subtle ways in which they would sabotage their labor, a sharp clandestine mockery of their masters. Now they are wolves, his people. So, so um, one of the things that happens in, in the novel then is that that um, the British Army and and Tower Hill move up to the capital, and and there's a powerful scene. I mean, it's interesting because you just read a little about bringing books into the books as witness to the history almost of slavery, um, and and at the time the the Library of Congress existed in the Capitol building itself. Um, I, I wonder if you could read some of the, um, the the parts of your of your novel in which in which that battle takes place, that burning takes place. If you want to set that up ahead of time too, please do. Uh, okay. Um, I'll skip ahead to that then. Was there something you wanted to read before that, Wayne? Um, I, I, yeah, I think I would like to, Michael, because I wanted to um, follow a little bit of what happens with uh, Jacob and Sarai. Good. Okay. Because um, they are, uh, uh, they both end up fighting with a, a um, sort of guerrilla group for the American side, and they are captured and they are um, imprisoned in a British rocket ship called the Erebus. And that's in Baltimore Harbor. Uh, and I, they're in prison in the, in the harbor when, uh, when Fort McHenry is, is shelled and that becomes, you know, Francis Scott Key looked at that and wrote the Star Spangled Banner. So again, it's that, um, Sarai can't see that. She's chained in the hold of a ship as she was, a, you know, as a baby coming to this country. But now she's chained with Jacob. Uh, and for her, Jacob has had to go through this um, taking away of his freedom and becoming some of some, getting some of the experience of what it was to be enslaved himself before they can become uh, equal, before, before she feels he can have the empathy to understand her condition. Now at this time, he is unconscious because of his wounds and she is pregnant. Okay, mm -hmm. and again, remember that uh, the ship they're in is called the Erebus. I mean, can I just go back, Wayne, can you yeah. clarify something a little bit for me and, and maybe others in the audience too. So um, Sarai has been basically rejected by the people, the yeah. former slaves who went over because she was the mistress of, of Hallam. Um, but she's, she's now pregnant. And she's been yeah. captured by the, the British, and she's in the hold of one of their ships as they moved up toward um, 
Right. Toward the capital. Okay. Go ahead. Time is not an anchor, or it is a chain to which the anchor is secured, sometimes taut, sometimes slack. In the slack, she drifts back, floats in a cold darkness, laced with shivering tendrils of light until the anchor chain snaps taut again. And now she is back in the belly of Jesus, as the child stirring in her belly is in the ship of her own body, waiting to be born from chains into chains, to be born nailed to the cross of itself. She's back in Jesus, a tiny scrap of a person, pressed to the steaming flesh of her chained people, with them, of them, the memory of it as real as the skin on the hand she looks at now in the gloom of the hole, fluttering her fingers before her eyes, the memory of it a lie, her past a construct gathered to her mind from Tower Hill's stories, the foundation that he had built for both of them their true history torn from them as they had been torn from it. A cold, hard corner of her mind, knowing the vision of the past that had just encompassed her, had come to her from the heated skin of her lover, his body wrapped to hers, had come to her from the darkness and groans and creaks of this prison that held her now, rocking her on the same water that had brought her here in the first ship. She hears the curses of the sailors penetrating down through the deck, pulling her back to this place, Erebus, Jesus, both. Jacob stirs against her, moans, his body only heat and bones, skin thin as paper, his mind as adrift as hers, more. He has not said a word, his eyes when they flutter open see nothing, his hand on her abdomen, mindlessly drawn to the new life he must feel under his palm her lips around her nipple, as the childhood's, as the child Tower Hill's lips at once pressed against her mother's breast or his mother's breast or, or their mother's breast. Jacob's mouth slips away. She has no milk, but something flows from her, thin and transparent. She cradles his head against her again, feels the draw of him. She floats away, Erebus, Jesus, is her mouth searching for substance at her mother's breast, the five-year-old boy who would be Tower Hill next to her, both of them suckling greedily in unison, their mother stroking their backs saying, yes, yes, in English, a corner of her mind knows can't be hers. She feels the strong suck of Jacob's mouth at her useless dug, the child inside her kicking sharply against the wall of her belly, starving inside her, a memory built of taste and smell and sound coming to her, her mother's skin going from hot to cold, the nipple swollen in her mouth, dry and abrasive, the stink in her nostrils like something alive and writhing, the void when her mother is torn away, her wail and Tower Hills rising to heaven, the birth cry of their rage, Jesus, Erebus, the ship then and the ship now rock together, disembodied voices, curses that filter down to her ears, the wood creaks and groans, emerging of what she cannot possibly remember but does. The closing of a circle. Had she been born on that ship? It had to be. It had to be, Tower Hill had said. She and their nameless dead brother and sister. It had to be what? The rush of water and blood from her mother onto the deck stained and foul with the effluvia of all those who it had been and would be affixed to that place. Trickling down through the hair thin cracks to flow into the sea, where both their, no, both her mothers had finally been thrown, drifting to the bottom, their hands raised back to the ship, their lives the gift from both those mothers. Of, or of one, she does not know. She sits up, pulling her nipple from Jacob's mouth, the transparent liquid that had begun flowing from her, trickling from the side of his mouth. She kisses him, tastes it, bitter on her tongue, the child inside her kicking frantically. She bends to feed herself from herself, knowing only that she must live, knowing only that this child inside her must be born and must know its story. So, Part of what this novel, novel does so powerfully, Wayne, and I, I thank you for reading that passage. 
the novel tells her story too. The novel tells the story in in ways that that I've not I've not read before, and and the um, the pain of it is hard, but the the empathy that it it brings forth in me is is so important, and I'm so grateful for it. So then then part of the story then is moving up toward Washington and and. Uh, not, now I'm not jumping ahead of myself here. <laughs> you want to read some of that, please? Uh, uh, this, this will be my the last scene I'll, I'll, I'll read. Um, and, you know, again, uh, I, thank you for what you just said also, because I, I think that's important. Um, it, it, this is not my personal history I'm writing about, nor your personal history, but it is our it our it is our history as Americans, and that and and what I, you know, had the, I guess the arrogance to do here, but I think the necessity is, is as much as possible, um, through fiction, through imagination, to to allow that empathy to be something that we, can experience and feel. Um, so, all right, my last thing I'll read, this is, this is Tower Hill. And this is when, uh, and again, this actually happened. The British burned the Capitol and they burned the White House. Um, something which today maybe a lot, uh, will be something a lot of us wanna think about um, or not. Um, so this is Tower Hill at the Capitol with the uh, Colonial Marines and the British. He's looking at the building. They have gone, marched into Washington. The two, two structures are made of enormous blocks of sandstone and their roofs are iron. But between them, he knows the plans are to join them under a great dome is only a connecting wooden pa passageway. It will burn. The rest must be put to the fire from the inside out. Cockburn and Scott, Cockburn's the British Admiral in charge of this. Cockburn and Scott enter with some of the fusiliers who are carrying a tripod and several Congreve rockets. The Admiral apparently has become fond of them. A mistake, Tower Hill thinks. He hurries after them. Just inside the door, an old slave dressed in silk pantaloons and a white wig tries to block his way. Where you going, boy? The old man demands. Tower Hill grabs him by the two sides of his vest, lifts him and puts him aside. High firestone columns rise to support a vaulted ceiling and glass skylights, red silk curtains hanging ceiling the floor, creating what seems to his eyes a jarring opulence against the elegantly simple architecture of the room. A huge carved eagle wings spread in a marble statue of a woman holding a document stand above and behind the rostrum at the head of the chamber. The Constitution of the United States of America. He remembers Cedric Hallam, Jacob's father, standing as he read that document to Jacob and Sarai and himself, a believer in educating darkies, if not freeing them. His eyes shining, his lips trembling, reading to his captive audience in the book line sanctuary that had been his study, the sanctuary of lies, the repository of lies. Cockburn laughing like a schoolboy has set up the tripod and before Tower Hill can warn him, sets off a rocket aimed at the ceiling. It bursts in a flower of red showering sparks and shrapnel that ricochet off floors and tables, surprisingly do not kill anyone. Cockburn, his face blackened by powder, looks uncharacteristically embarrassed for a moment, but then recovers himself and stands on the speaker's chair at the head of the room. What say you gentlemen, he yells, his voice echoing, Shall this harbor of Yankee democracy be burned? All for it say aye. Most of the men in the room laugh and yell aye, a, a wave of giddiness running through the room. The soldiers are piling up furniture, lugging in desks and cabinets and chairs they've dragged from the offices along the corridors, slathering them with gunpowder paste, giggling and giddy. Leave the bloody corridors clear, he hears Scott shout. Cockburn himself lights the fire. It shoots up to the ceiling, a wave of heat fanning out. More, he yells, more fuel for Mr. Monroe's bonfire. He spots Tower Hill. What say, you, my good sergeant, shall we proceed? What more do we need to feed this Republican blaze? 
He lifts and lowers himself on his tiptoes, excited as a child, the flames reflected in his eyes. What they need comes to Tower Hill. Words, he says. He turns, watch, searching the chamber, spots the old slave still near the entrance, strides over to the man, calling for Gray, Craney, Mingo, and Neb to follow him. The old man looks at him defiantly. Where's the library, Tower Hill asks. Call the Library of Congress here, the old man says, and the library of this Congress ain't a place for no monster, traitorous trash like you. Neb has his knife at the man's throat before Tower Hill can say a word. You take us, old man, I carve you another smile. You do that, boy. Leave him, Tower Hill says, suddenly weary. I remember what it should be. He leads them down the connected wooden corridor to the north wing, passing the Senate on the first floor, then in the Supreme Court chamber, where the other soldiers are piling furniture into a huge pyramid. Then upstairs, following his memory, where he flings open the heavy, hole, the heavy oak doors. Shelves with thousands of books in them stand above him on all sides. Hallam's study, writ large. As his eyes brush the leather spines, he feels the words stir all around him, squirming on the pages, scurrying to slyly configure themselves to the prospects notched in his mind, pretending to shape the world into beauty. Millions of words, a tower hill of lies, a little black boy, his brain crawling with insectoid words, spewing them from his lips as if they were his, as if he could own them, as if they could save him. This freak of nature, the educated Negro, the, the terror in, his, in their lives. He goes to the shelves and begins gathering armfuls of the books, throwing them onto the floor. This harbor of Yankee democracy. Neb grinning at him. Captain Book laughing at him, laughing with him. He laughs with Neb, two black men laughing together in the face of lies. Law books, Glanville, Hale and Coke, Boswell's Journey of a Tour of the Hebrides, Bertram's Travels, History of the Colony of Massachusetts Bay, John Locke, the end of law is not to abolish or restrain, but to preserve and enlarge freedom. Shakespeare, hath not a Negro organs, he will, pro he will proclaim to Neb. Dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a white man is. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, do we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. Jefferson, Cedric Hallam standing like Moses descended from the mount, like God in his heaven, reading down to them, we hold these lies to be self-evident. You're gonna read them all book, Neb says. Craney looks at them worriedly. I've been waiting on this, Tower Hill. Let him wait, Neb says. Captain Book reading. Tower Hill po points at the shelves. Craney, you, Mingo, remember the day the North Barn burned? Craney looks at him, puzzled. Remember how we made a line past buckets? Sure, Tower Hill, put out the fire. You get the others. Get the British, too. Form a line. Here, back to Cockburn. Le Neb laughs, seeing it. Going to pass the fire. Craney nods. Oh, sure, Tower Hill, we can do that. Then go. At first, they pass the books along the line of men stretching from the library back to the south wing. But it's too slow, and soon soldiers are taking armloads, throwing some into the now burning Senate chamber, running more over to Cockburn in the other wing, throwing books onto the bonfire, the heat blasting back into their faces, woolen uniforms growing hotter, sweat soaking into the fiber, steaming so the little clouds hover over their shoulders as they run. Other soldiers have found documents in the clerk's office downstairs and throw them into the flames as well. Tower Hill tears down a damask curtain from an anteroom near the library, fills it time and again with load after load of books, running back and forth, panting, breathing in lungfuls of hot smoke from the burning pages, tasting their ash on his lips. Finally, the room is empty and he runs with the last load and flings it onto the fire. The books flare as they hit the flames, 
burst into flame themselves, pages swiftly blackening and curling. The heat has grown unbearable, and some men scream in, scream in pain as they inadvertently touch metal buckles or buttons. Fire runs up the silk curtains. The glass of skylights melts and drips, molten glass falling on one man's back, threatening to torch him as his comrades roll him on the floor. Ross, sweat running on his blackened face, finally yells at them to evacuate the buildings. Outside, Tower Hill stands with Cockburn, Ross, and the others, watching from a safe distance. Their features strangely animated and fluid in the light from the fire. It is full night now. But the flames shooting up from the two buildings and from the fires across town in the Navy Yard set by the Americans themselves illuminate the sky with false daylight. Tower Hill walks away from the, lashing, from the laughing Englishman over to the silent formation of his own people, standing in solemn witness, each of them to a man and woman, understanding what the British will never understand about what they are seeing on this night. He walks back further until he can take in all of the picture. But as the buildings burn, it is only the image of books flaring like moths drawing into a fire that he sees in front of his eyes. The books and a room where three children sit surrounded by other books, entranced by lies and promises. He wants to rejoice, to flicker and elongate and dance like a flame himself at this culmination for which he has been waiting and killing. His life a line of fire moving inexorably from the flames of the plantation's manor house to this blaze lighting the skies over Washington. Something loosens in him at this moment, a fist that he's been squeezing, that has been squeezing his heart for so long, he no longer knows it is there until it suddenly releases its grip. He has come to this place and has done what he has needed to do. He has liberated the words and now he can see them rise phoenix light, phoenix light from the flames, their letters twisting and writhing, shaping into forms unforeseen by those who had fashioned them, released now into the world like unwrapped promises. And uh, I go in there. Wow. The repository of lies. I'm, I'm struck as I listen to you read that, Wayne, that I grew up having held before me um, Emerson's or Thoreau's um, books of the treasured wealth of the world, a fit inheritance for generations and nations. And what what Tower Hill is experiencing there, what you bring out so powerfully is that the books that we read that were in the Library of Congress that I read growing up did not tell his story. His story was not part of that. And so that anger at the books that had left him out, I, I, think there, I think there are important parallels to a lot of the divisiveness that we experience today of people feeling their stories are not being told, their stories are not being heard, and the importance of, of, of listening, of, of the value of, of what this novel gives us to, to hear a different point of view, another point of view, to develop our own empathy for people who've been marginalized and, and left out for, for whatever reasons and however. Um, I, I, it's just stunning. And, and I thank you, um, thank you for the powerful writing and, and the, the courage to try to tell this story, which is, which is so important and, and so undertold. I think, uh, yeah, thank you, Michael. That, it, it, that's, that's very important to, to understand. And it's, it's important to understand also that the, the, the words not only didn't tell his story, but, but, they, but he wanted them to be his story. That, that the words themselves, the unwrapped, you know, the promises themselves, which were unwrapped, were for only a certain group of people. Yeah. But the words themselves were universal. And when he heard them, it's like the word Jesus for the slave ship and, and what Jesus came to mean for other people. 
the words, what, what, what was so frustrating, you know, is, is that they, they should have included everyone, they should have included him. And the tension of our history has been, been that movement, you know, towards the ideal that we, that we set for ourselves and the, the contradictions, the people who are not inc included in, in that ideal. That, that inequality and that move yeah. towards that equality, which, which exists to today. So he, he didn't hate the words, he, he, he wanted them for his, he said, right. these should include me. You yeah. say we're all created equal. I'm we too, you know, it, it, it's all of us. And, that, and yeah. that's, that's, I mean, for me, that's the movement of American history. And that the, the, the ideal and hunger for inclusiveness the um, the irony, oh, today. yes, today too, and man, the irony of of um, of how we we can read so narrowly that we think it's about me and not about you. Yeah. Um, it's stunning. I one other thing I just kind of want to add that that struck me when you were reading that passage, and just just like the British wanted to recruit the. The slaves, because they knew the plantations and they knew the area, um, the slaves built the capital, and they knew how to get in there, and and where things were. Um, and, and the White, and, house, uh, White house as well, yeah. Yeah, and so and we we but those are not not knowing and not seeing or choosing not to see creates so much of this of this anxiety and fear and feeling left out. Um, it's just stunning. I think I think it would be good to move to um, allow people to ask questions of you, Wayne. And Neil, maybe you could come back in and and moderate those questions for for Wayne Carlin and and about this wonderful book, um, A Wolf by the Ears. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I can't um, I can't add to what you've said, um, but I am. Stunned. I, I told my students that um, the it's not so much it, it's it's equal parts the the story that you're telling, but then it's also how you tell it, and and so thank you very much for that. Um, we do have some questions here, so maybe we can take a few minutes to, and, and if anyone wants to add questions or ask questions, just click on the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Um, so Mick asked, uh, did Sarai have the freedom to choose the position that she's in? And I think Michael kind of touched on that a little bit, but um, if you want to say anything more than, than that. She had some choice, but, but really basically no. I mean, she was, um, you know, she, she grew up very close to Jacob yeah. and was attracted to him. So, so there was that, but at the same time, she was very aware that uh, she had no power in the situation. So it, was, it wasn't until uh, that he, it wasn't until he lost everything until the plantation was, was burned that she was able to really feel close to him. And, and even, you know, that had not been a choice for her because, um, she tragically got rejected by her own people at, at that point. Um, before she's captured, though, she has made up her mind to go back to her people. But um, it, it is only when Jacob loses power himself and is able to somewhat feel her experience that she's able to get uh, close to him in a voluntary way. Okay. Um. So Jake sent something in about cultural appropriation. Now you and I have talked about this before, but do you want to say anything about that? Um, what, what, I, what I said to Michael, I mean, it, this yeah. is you know, not my story yet. It's all our stories as Americans. And, and I think um, the, uh, you know, <laughs> In, in one sense, um, I know as little about being a a Jacob Hallam, being a, a you know American you know white American plantation owner in the 19th century, than I do about being an enslaved person. I'm you know very different background from all of that. I think it's you know it's my it's my job as a writer um, to 
to avoid what I think is the worst part of cultural uh, or the bad part of cultural appropriation, um, which is to do it dishonestly, to do it, um, you know, to write about things through stereotypes and cliches and to re reinforce, um, reinforce those things through the writing. So, but, but in terms of, of um, you know, what, what I do as a fiction writer is imagine people's lives and they're not my, like my life. And I hope in, I hope in that, that empathy that I have to feel in writing the characters is, is an empathy that the readers uh, come to share also. I don't know who said it. It was a Donald Hall poet that the, the more personal you make it, the more universal it becomes. And I think that the characters that you've created and the experiences that they've that, that, that you convey through these very these 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 characters, they 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 embody human experience. And I think it's not, you know, I mean it is it is particular, but you've you've done it in such a way that conveys a sense of the genuine and and, and thank you for that. Um, this is a, a I, think, I think as I mean this is you do uh, or what I do anyway as a writer is to is to uh, in a sense role play the way an actor does. I try to think of the circumstance of, of the character and then to you know how if I were that person how would I be reacting what, what would I be thinking about and it's up to the reader to decide how you know well that that happens or, or does not happen. Uh, how do you capture such vivid images? I mean, reality, yes, yeah, it's, it, it's related to, to, without having actually lived the experience such as uh, Sarai's pregnancy. How, how... Yeah, uh, same, same, same answer. <laughs> yeah, it is actually. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Same answer. I've, I've never, I've never been pregnant, and probably never will be. Um, but, no. <laughs> and and um, you know, is that uh, again? That's I guess, that's what you try to do as a writer. You know, in yeah. this, in the same way that an actor does. If, if I were this person, what would it be like? I mean, that's that's imagination. That's empathy. That's just trying. Uh, you know, all my life as as a writer, that's something that I've tried to develop tried to see the world through other people's eyes and feelings and emotions and so on. So, um, I, you know, I hope that works. So Mark comments on the fact of it being a, an amazing book that speaks to this moment, to what led to this moment. Um, and maybe you can speak a little bit about how the book is, is speaks to what's going on in this country right now. I know you've done it somewhat. But yeah. Well, any, any, any other? You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't avoid that question today. Yeah. Right. Right. The day when we're, when we're still in the middle, still in the middle of the election, but this has been an election, you know, which has very much been about how we define ourselves as a country. And that's, that's what the book is about. And, that struggle to define ourselves, which is in a large way the same struggle. You know, are we inclusive or, or are we exclusive? Um, is, is what we still see unresolved and, and happening all around us today. And there's still a lot of people who don't have voices either. So, you know, you're, all right, let me. A lot of people can't, I can't imagine, you know, you take something like, like, uh, Black Lives Matter, right? There are a lot of people can't imagine, well, why do they matter more than other lives? Well, no, why is matter? So they, they can't imagine the experience, you know, that, that, that experience, which, which is that those lives have not mattered, have not seemed to matter to other people by the people who have lived them. You know, they can't, they can't put themselves into, into that position of understanding why that why that matters. <laughs> I 
Well, maybe on that note, yeah, I mean, um, why why are you so connected to this Southern Maryland area? What like what 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 is it that intrigues you? I mean, Leonardtown Wharf. I mean, we sat down there and you read passages of it, and you know, what is it about the the local history that intrigues you, and and makes you want to keep writing about? I mean, you, you've dedicated your life to, you know, speaking about cycles of violence and how to, how to break them. You've documented the, 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 the audacity of going to war, um, but, but somehow the, the local history, it seems like you just keep coming back to. And even when you, you told me about um, that stuffed ham thing that's of a, of a local nature, I mean, like, what is it about this area that, 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 you, you just, you, you can't seem to get enough of. Well, it's been a real gift gift as a writer. Uh, for, one, for one thing, I think it's it's a microcosm of the country, you know, and the, and the history of the country. So there's a, you know, the, the very direct fact that the things I'm writing about in this novel, I mean, happen, you know, within, uh, around my house, around, around the place where we lived. And because it's, it's, it's still a rural county, um, a lot of the geography is still there, so it's it's easy to envision. But that that conflict, you know, this this is Maryland. It's Southern Maryland, and it's and it's the South. This was a plantation system here, you know, and this was a place colonized, um, you know, in the in the 1600s by, by by expropriating land of the Native Americans, and this is a place today which is, um, you know still in the midst of this, this election and this conflict, but um, whose economy went from being agricultural on the water and on the land to being based on, on, a, you know, mil uh, on, on a military base. The economy being based on basically on, on, on warfare and technology and so on. So so much of what's, what just happened in the country happens in this you know, very limited geographic area that we live in. And um, you know, again, discovering what happened to these uh, enslaved people during the War of 1812, how they'd gone over to the to the British like that. Um, wow. I mean, that, that, again, I, I could picture it happening right right around the area where I lived. Uh, a block from my house, there's a there's a a you know country road called Kitamaquan, which is the name of the uh, of the Tayak of the Piscataway chief who, who um, you know, was the chief of the people who owned this land when the British came here. Uh, it, you see it everywhere. So yeah, it's it's been a it's been a gift to me as a, as a writer. By the way, Neil, speaking of Leonardtown, also that street where, um, you know, you've been there also in that town square, which was once a a, a slave market. You know, there's there's war memorials there. And there's there's uh, memorials to World War II and the Vietnam War and the Korean War and, and the present war. There's also separately a, a World War I monument. And you look at the names of the dead on that monument and they're segregated. There's names under colored and their names under white. I mean, the, 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 the history of that place. Um, one, one of the people who, who called in now, you know, came to Leonardtown to, to pick at the courthouse during the days of segregation, when this was a segregated county. All that history is here. You know, all the history that, that is, but what's wrong with us and the attempt to make it right, you know, as a country is, is here right, right around us. And the attempt to make it right. And I think that the work that you've done in, in this book and in all of your work is an attempt to make it right. I hope so. I, so you know, you know, it is, and I, and I sometimes I wonder, how is it that we haven't graduated to a, a, a different level of consciousness? And then, then, then I get a headache, and then I stop thinking about it. But, 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 but that's, that's, that's what we're working toward, man, right? <laughs> but what you've done in this book, and for those of you who would like to order it, please go to the CSM, the College of Southern Maryland website. And there's a link there to order the book. Um, and as you. That's, that's with 30% off. That, that particular link has 30% off. So I recommend That's it. true. 
but as but as you, if you just got a taste of what it's about and and the and the and the quality of the of the writing and i agree with michael i i i, I think you've you've gone on to another atmosphere altogether i the, the the quality of the writing is amazing and and i think that you know once it starts getting cold outside and you know you just curl up with a good book it's a good book and and the and the and 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 the and the and the the language itself will carry you through this very um, difficult but inspiring story. So thank you all very thank much. You. Thank, thank you, Wayne. Thanks, and, Neil, and thank you, Rachel, and you know, thank you, thank you for providing the forum. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, thanks everybody for watching and listening.